Hej! Oj, det var högt. Jag, jag uppgraderar min laptop. Den här var bättre på Toast faktiskt. Uh, just det. Uh, anyone here prefer that I do this in English? Anyone not speak Swedish? Yeah, we got a few. Good, I'll do it in English. I actually prefer doing it in English because most of the words are in English and otherwise I have to speak Swedish. Swedish. So is, is it okay if I do it in English? I, I promise to do it in Swedish. If it's okay to do it, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so yes, this whole Agile thing. How many of you have heard about Agile? Mm, yeah, how many of you are trying to apply some sort of Agile product development approach? This is... This is, yeah, this thing has gone mainstream, right? It's not this weird uh, new kid on the block thing. It's, it's, it's gone mainstream. And uh, by pure coincidence, I kind of landed in this thing about maybe 10, 15 years ago. And then later on, it became known as Agile. And they've basically been trying to help companies make, make sense of it and find effective ways of working. But what I have noticed is when something gets super hyped, it also gets a little bit misunderstood, right? That's like I think Christian mentioned the same thing about machine learning, and you could probably say the same thing about most fields, right? Something gets super popular, super hyped, it, you sometimes lose the, the, the core message. Hence, the toaster. I'm going to use a very silly metaphor to illustrate this, okay? Bear with me, it's a silly metaphor, but it, it does have a point. So, yeah, let's imagine that um, over here is a development team, okay? And what they develop is toast, right? Uh, the problem is their toast looks like that. Doesn't taste very well. Burnt toast. So their sales aren't doing very well. Right, let's just call this company A. Right. So they're like, hmm, we need to do something about this problem. We need, we need to produce uh, better toast and get happier customers. So what do you do? Well, obviously you bring in a consultant, right? It's the first thing you always do to solve any problem, right? Yeah, good. So you bring in a consultant, and uh, that consultant uh, points out the obvious, <laughs> which is what we consultants do, and uh, says, you know what? You have a quality problem. Thank you. Uh, do you have quality control? And they say, uh, actually, actually, no. We just have a teamer that, that makes toast. And well, obviously, you need quality control because you have quality problems, right? So let's introduce quality control. And then they hire this other team. And what does that other team do, do you suppose? Any guess? Hint? <laughs> yeah, this is the quality control team, right? They're like, hmm, okay. No. Right, maybe we can make it a little better like that. There we go. A bit better, right? Not good, but better. Ship it. All right. Off it goes. Damn. And they made things better, didn't they? Right? Or did they? How many would say they made things better? Nobody? Come on. Right? The toast tastes better. I can testify that personally. <laughs> Right? But how many would argue that they didn't make things better? A very mixed bag here, right? Yeah, wh what's interesting here is imagine this, this uh, you know, toast burning team over here, right? <laughs> and then we have the toast scraping team here. Um, how many of you recognize this problem, by the way? How many of you have like toast scraping teams and have toast scraping going on in your organization? You can be honest, you're, you're among friends, right? We got mostly on that side. I don't know why. Was that how we organized the room, right? So um, imagine this toast burning team they're doing Scrum. <laughs> Scrum is this, you know, uh, framework, right? And, and uh, uh, like an, an agile process framework. And uh, you look at what they're doing, they're like, oh yeah, they have Scrum Masters, they have Product Owner, and they have, how many of you use Scrum or something like it? Right. So most of you have touched upon this, right? So they have all the external attributes. It looks Scrummy, right? But they missed the point. So Scrum was added to the organization like, like, uh, like, like a Band-Aid. And now we have this team burning toast, but they're measuring velocity on that. They're making burn-up charts, right? <laughs> they, have all, they have a backlog, right? Everyth everything is there. But then we have this handoff and this other team fixing the problems. <laughs> Distance between the, the development team and the customers. A long feedback loop. We actually made things worse. Because now we have a longer feedback loop. Now we have handoffs. We have longer distance between the teams and the, and, and, and the customers. And we have to pay salaries to this quality control team. 
So th th that's an example of kind of misapplied agile, right? Okay. So let's imagine now a, a company B, which was having this, this, the same problem with, with burnt toast, right? What they do instead is they make the developers eat toast. <laughs> that's their approach, right? Hey, developers, I want you to eat your own toast. And if, it, okay, let's say it's a product that, that isn't consumable by the team themselves, well, then at least go out in the field and watch your users, right? So let's say we're building a product, an expert system for doctors, right? A and the team is not a doctor. Okay, so go out and sit next to a doctor who's using your system, watch them cry, <laughs> right? <laughs> then you learn, right? So you build empathy. You'll find empathy deep down in the hearts of most people somewhere, right? if you dig deep enough, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that team, looks at how their product is used. They might put a, a tester on, on the team to, to help out. So I'm not saying we shouldn't have testers, but I'm saying they should be on the team, not some separate function. And that tester is not owning quality themselves. That tester is helping the team become quality aware, right? This team goes out in the field, watches people use their product, the toast. They learn how to make better toast. And they also learn about customers and customer needs that they maybe didn't know about. Like, oh, you know what? This customer wants something on top of the toast, maybe, right? They learn to make toast faster and, 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 and better, and the business thrives, and ev everyone lives happily ever after. Sounds nice and simple, doesn't it? Yeah, not quite. <laughs> but my point is that uh, we, we should distinguish between Agile on the surface, this kind of pretend Agile, where we're doing all the, all the, all the meetings and all the artifacts and all the roles, but kind of miss the point, versus this more kind of what I'll call real Agile, which I'm going to draw. can be summarized in, in a very simple picture. Some kind of cross-functional, self-organizing, rather small team, right? Directly in contact with real customers. Building the product in steps, not building the whole thing and delivering at the end, but delivering regularly and getting feedback, right? But you know, you probably know most of this. So this, this is nothing new. But if we have multiple teams, well, it's the same deal, basically just looks a little bit different. So now we have three teams, customer, customers, right? Integrate the product on a regular basis and then get the feedback. High level core idea, right? So you, you, you can do this without necessarily following a specific recipe such as Scrum. Okay, so um, Scrum, extreme programming, Kanban, all these different techniques they are useful as a recipe. It's like if you're going to learn to cook, it's useful to have a recipe sometimes, if you're new. You take the recipe, do exactly what it says, and you'll be pretty okay. Your food will not completely suck. It'll be okay, right? It won't be awesome. <laughs> it won't give you a, a huge competitive edge just following the recipe, but it, it's, it's a starting point. So I would say, yeah, if you're new to Agile and, and, and you have a problem with, with burnt toast <laughs> or whatever, uh, go ahead and apply an Agile method by the book religiously. Fine, go ahead. Just realize, though, that the recipe itself is not a goal. It's just a tool, right? And at some point, you might need to remove the training wheels, be willing to break some of the rules, combine some of the different recipes, or even make your own recipes. So yeah, sometimes I, s I see teams that just get too, too caught up in the practicalities of, of Agile development, and they, and they lose the kind of core idea. Make sense? So how many of you recognize that problem, by the way? I'm just curious. Getting caught up in all the technicalities, missing the point, right? It's, it's fairly common. Okay. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about Lego. Lego's interesting. Their Agile journey started with a massive failure, and that triggered their Agile journey. They had this wonderful idea about seven, eight years ago. Let's build an online universe where people can build, like, Lego digitally. Right? So virtual Lego, the product was called Lego Universe. And the idea was that all the kids, yeah, are playing together online. And, um, yeah, they spent, they were very ambitious. Lego is very quality-minded, very ambitious. They have an amazingly good track record for building awesome products, successful company. So they were very like, oh, this has to be perfect. It's got to be great, right? So they obsessed over this. So they spent, uh, on average, they had 250 people on a project over a four-year period, right? So how many many years is that? Do the math. You're not that tired, I don't believe it. Yes? 250 people, four years. Thousand man years, all right? Yeah, thousand man years to build a game. Uh, it was beautiful. 
Uh, the thing is, the teams, of course, once they released it, it wasn't that successful. They had to shut it down after two years because it was built in all these false assumptions. And one of the false assumptions was that kids really, really care that things look just like Lego, sound just like Lego, and that all the pieces are there. Guess what? They don't, right? But the managers at Lego really thought they did. So built on all these false assumptions, four years of development, then a big bang release, and then it kind of failed. Um, incidentally, the teams were using Scrum, but they missed one little aspect of it. They were doing this pretend Scrum I'm talking about, right? They were doing all the, all the things, but they missed one little detail, and that's this error right here. That's the error from the team to the actual kids, right? So they were iterating internally, and the manager's opinions were driving the, the priorities instead of the actual opinions of the kids. And then, yeah, kind of failed. So any tool can be misapplied. Right? At the same time, um, and uh, another very interesting project was, was going on uh, in Sweden. A guy named Marcus was working on his little hobby project, um, which he actually released after just six days of coding. He put it into production um, worldwide, just, just released it. And uh, the concept was like, okay, I'm in this really ugly, uh, blocky 3D world, and I walked up to a, to a one by one by one meter piece of dirt, and I hit it with my hand, and boom, now I got it here, and I can put it over there. Isn't that a great game? Right? Think it's going to succeed? <laughs> well, you, you probably know which game this is, right? What are we talking about? Minecraft, right? I, I was one of the early users because I have four kids and we love gaming, so, so we were one of the early users for this. And you can actually build kind of cool things with these blocks. But of course, it wasn't great. So he got feedback via Twitter. That was his, his, uh, his uh, kind of feedback channel. And then people say, like, you know, I want to be able to uh, have some challenge here, what, you know, some, something, something to do. Well, okay, how about monsters come in the night? You have to, you have to protect yourself. Okay. Uh, and he got feedback, and he acted on that feedback, and literally released more than 100 times in the, in the first year based on that feedback. So weather systems got, got added and all kinds of yeah, fun things. And it gradually turned in from this kind of crappy experiment into an actually really fun game based on that real feedback from real users. And then as an experiment, he started charging money for it, just as an experiment, uh, maybe 70, 80 kroners. And then, yeah, 15 months later, he had earned $80 million. So he had $80 million on the bank account, which is quite uncommon for a kind of independent game developer who's just trying out some idea. Uh, started building up a team around it, created a company around it, Mojang, and then they got sold to uh, those guys, Microsoft, <laughs> for two and a half billion. And yeah, the rest is history. But what's interesting is how these two companies were trying to solve the same kind of problem, right? Build an online building experience for kids. They just had a very different approach. And incidentally, the Lego teams were using some kind of a pretend scrum, right? Doing all the external attributes and not really succeeding. Well, these guys at Mojang, I'm working with them now, they, th these teams kind of get it, at least the, the, the core um, Minecraft game development teams, they, they kind of get it. It's in their heart that we do this. We deliver often, we get feedback, we don't hand off testing to anybody else. It's considered obvious. But it doesn't look like, you know, you won't see like um, Scrum by the book in that team, really. So again, I'm not saying we shouldn't do things by the book. It's useful in the beginning but we shouldn't get caught up with, with the rules and, and, the, and, the, and the rituals. Instead, just think about the core idea, right? Iterating, getting feedback, working in small cross-functional teams. Okay, Lego is interesting because that project failed, but they learned from it. And that's what I think defines a successful company. Successful companies have failures too, but they learn from them and, th and they really use those, those learnings. So that triggered an, an, an agile journey at Lego, which is spreading really fast to all kinds of different departments. So yeah, very interesting. All right, um, so why, why is this thing spreading so much? Agile went from being this kind of niche thing into being mainstream. Now, I've thought a lot about that and kind of observed with different companies what's actually going on and asked like, okay, so why, you know, now, now this department, which is, you know, doing something completely different, it's a marketing department or a recruiting department or a leadership team, now, now they're starting to apply an Agile mindset. These guys over here are using Agile for something completely different. Why is it spreading so fast? And I think uh, something that someone at Lego said kind of, I think, captures it nicely. He said, we, we're really good at waterfall. Like the waterfall development uh, is pretty much just a word for, you know, this way of developing where we have linear handoffs, right? Someone writes requirements, hands off a document to design, hands off a document to development. They write a bunch of code, hand off to test. That whole way of working, plan-driven approach. He said, we're actually, we actually, we're actually pretty good at that. 
but it doesn't help anymore. The world is moving too fast. So no matter how good we are at waterfall, it's, it's not helping us anymore. Therefore, we, we, we need to stop using that way of working and apply an agile approach. And it was a kind of a, a traumatic thing for them, for them to realize that this way of working that they've optimized for many years isn't working anymore. So I think, I and after that, it kind of became obvious, you know, you look around, the world is getting more complex, right? I mean, it's more fast moving. We have more interconnected parts. We have internet, we have Twitter. Things happening here can influence things happening in other countries immediately, right? We all know that. But that, of course, means increased complexity. It's harder to predict what's going to happen, right? And of course, technology, the, the, the rate of technology development, since that's very fast too, it's inherently hard to, to have a plan-driven approach. So uh, I'll, there's a metaphor I like to use. Um, let's say we're going to go on, on a journey, right? And with the waterfall approach, we would kind of draw up a map of the terrain and say, well, there's a mountain range, there's a river, there, there's a bridge, and I'll plot out the journey. We, we're here now, I want to get to there, and in order to do that, I need to go here and then cross that river, and then you know, we'll sleep over, over here, make camp there, etc. We make a plan, and if I make a really good plan, then, then, then we'll succeed, right? That would work if the map is stable. But then we fast forward to today, and suddenly this map is full of uncertainty. I'm not sure, is that a mountain range or is it a swamp or what is it? Is that bridge still there? Uh, I'm not sure. The weather changes very fast over there. I'm, I'm no, nobody's even been in this terrain before. I have a vague sense of what it looks like, but who knows? So, oh, and it changes, right? So I can see that there's a field there, but then once I start moving and I get close, it's like, damn, it's now flooded. It's a swamp. Shit, right? <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta change my plan. So when the map itself is, is not clear and it's changing, then it doesn't matter how good you are at planning. You need to have an agile approach. Common misconception though, agile does not mean no planning. We still need to think about architecture. We need to think ahead. We need to make a plan. It's just that we don't make a, a very detailed plan. And the plan is considered a tool. We're going to be changing the plan as we learn. So yes, I planned to cross that river, but once I got there, I realized that it was too turbulent. So therefore, I need to change the plan, right? Um, I think Spotify is, is a pretty good example of that. Uh, Spotify is interesting because they've managed to turn a whole, a whole industry upside down. And also interesting because they have very tough competitors. They compete with Google and Apple, companies that have m infinitely more money, more resources, more people. A plus, Apple and Google own the platforms that Spotify runs on. So in theory, Spotify shouldn't have a chance. But still, they, they've managed to kind of totally disrupt this industry. And what I think is interesting there is that's another company where this is considered kind of obvious. In many cases, they don't even use the term agile. It's just considered like, well, this is obvious. We want to iterate and learn and move fast. So some core assumptions they had from the beginning turned out to be correct. Right? One of the core assumptions was people are willing to, 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 uh, um, to access music and not own it. And that's OK. Right? That was a hypothesis that turned out to be correct. Another hypothesis is it is technically possible to create an awesome music experience based on streaming. Correct, right? But assumption that was wrong was they assumed people will never pay for music. That's why they pirate copy. That's why they use Pirate Bay. Wrong. Turned out people are happy to pay for music if the experience is good. People were pirate copying not because they're evil and mean. They're doing it because they couldn't find another easy way to access music. And once that way was provided, they're happy to pay for it. Big surprise. So they made a pivot. Another big surprise was mobile, right? We built this product which was optimized for desktop, and suddenly this mobile becomes the standard way for, for, for uh, accessing music. Big surprise, had to make a big shift. That's an example of, of the map shifting, right? So really important to, to be able to react to this. Okay. So, uh, yeah. In summary then, the world is getting more complex. Agile is optimized for complexity. That's what I think Agile is spreading. It's ju it's ju it is a strategy for, for tackling complexity. Now, I would say a, a few years ago, Agile would be considered a competitive advantage, but that's about it. So let's say these two toast companies, right? Company A and Company B. Well, Company A might survive. They're, they're, they'll be okay. Um, this Company B will have a competitive advantage. They make better toast faster, but there's room for both. I think that's changing and it's, and, it's, and it's going to keep changing. And I'm hearing especially, for example, from banks is a good example. Banks have been waiting for a long time, holding on to kind of a, a conservative approach to development. Now I've met a lot of, of, of ex uh, bank executives in different countries around the world, different banks, and they're kind of panicking. 
what they're saying is, they're not saying, oh, Agile will help us you know, do a little better. They're saying, we need to go Agile or we will die because we're going to get disrupted by all these little Spotify's in the bank industry that are going to eat our lunch. And we basically don't have a choice. So that's one trend. Agile is, is changing from being a competitive advantage to being a competitive necessity. Basically, you don't even need to enter the game unless you have this approach. Right, but the word Agile, though, it's, it's a hype, right? The, the word Scrum, the word XP, uh, even newer concepts, right? You know, things like Lean Startup, DevOps. We are a fashion industry. We like to, to, to use you know, fancy words to hang things up on. I think these words are going to come and go, right? And if you look back in history, nothing in Agile is, is really new. Th these are old, this is ancient wisdom pretty much, just being recognized and given words. So Agile wasn't discovered, it, it was, or Ag Agile wasn't invented, it was discovered. It was a bunch of people looking at how do companies working in, in complex environments succeed? The ones that do succeed, what are they doing? And they found some patterns, cross-functional teams, uh, fast feedback, etc., autonomy, self-organization, transparency. And then basically took those and said, hey, let's, let's, let's make that more clear, how to do that in practice. And now we have Scrum, XP, etc., right? So what I think is going to happen is these words are going to keep coming and going. Don't worry too much about that. The principles beneath are, are timeless and, and, and they're here to stay. Unless the world somehow starts getting less complex, they're definitely here to stay. Another trend I'm seeing is how it's spreading. So within companies, typically it would be some kind of IT part of the company that starts uh, applying, for example, Scrum. Then other parts of the company get inspired and say, hey, those guys seem to be <laughs> having more fun uh, and they seem to be improving at a very fast rate. And some of those ideas might be useful here in our recruitment team or in our HR team, or in our management team, or in our mold production team, whatever it is. So then they take those ideas and they apply them over here. However, it looks a bit different. So recruitment team doing Scrum, their Scrum board contains recruits, right? They might have a shorter cycle, one week sprints. Their definition of success is not how a customer uses their product. Their definition of success is how fast can we process a recruit? How happy is that recruit? How happy is the team that that, that recruit ended up with, right? So they've taken the, the, the Agile approach and just mapped it to their domain. This is happening everywhere. I also see it jumping between different industries. So um, Yuan mentioned um, the, the Gripen project this morning. Very interesting project. I spent one day with them interviewing people to learn more about it because, was, and because I'd, uh, yeah, I'd heard this was very interesting. So I went to Lean Shopping, spent some time with them, and I was really fascinated. This was the first time I've seen like a, a such a big project, I think it was about 3,000 people all co-located, doing plane development I using an agile approach. So a scrum team, scrum boards, product owners, all the basic scrum stuff, but of course they had made some adaptations, right? Just like you should. But the key point that they kept emphasizing was teams, pilots. You even saw it on Yuan's picture, right? There's a pilot, there's one of the, one of the managers and one of the teams, and they're interacting on a daily basis, often in a quite informal fashion. So a team can try their latest build, give it to a pilot who can take, take it for a spin inside a simulator or even on a real plane and then give feedback. So very tight feedback. So yeah, so, so, so Agile is spreading uh, within companies also to different industries and of course you need to make adaptations, right? Scrum by the book, you pick up any random Scrum book and just do it by the book, it's normally optimized for software development just because that's the roots of Scrum. Just like Lean has roots from the car production or car development industry, right? It doesn't mean Lean is only for that industry, it just means that's the roots. So we've learned that Lean is applicable very widely. Same thing with Agile. It just happened to come from a bunch of programmers, but it's uh, applicable in many industries. All right. So, um, yeah, let's wrap this up. Some takeaways. If you're applying an Agile approach, which uh, you probably should if you're in an industry which is complex, which I'm guessing you are in, right? Don't fall for the dogma. Scrum is never going to be, it's never a goal to, uh, to implement Scrum by the book. You need to find a, a pr an approach that matches your situation. Keep in mind the, the core principles. And here's some recommendations for how to recognize what I call kind of pretend agile and real agile. It's not binary, obviously, but just some. So sticky notes on the wall does not mean real agile. <laughs> could still be useful, but uh, someone saying we're doing scrum means nothing. Someone saying we're doing sprints really means nothing. Having a product owner 
itself really means nothing. These are tools. Just like me holding a saw doesn't mean I'm successfully, you know, sawing down trees, right? So tools. The symptoms of what I think of as real agility are, well, first of all, you notice that there are teams. Work is organized into teams. You can see physically how people are working in teams rather small, right? You'll see things like teams of teams. So teams that are working, each team is working on its own, but they're also collaborating, integrating, doing demos together, doing planning together, delivering an integrated product. S but it's still kind of, it's, it's still organized in into teams. And these teams are small, they are self-organizing, so they have a lot of decision power on their own, and they're cross-functional. And they're getting more and more cross-functional. So the definition of cross-function is getting more and more wide. One example, a bank I met that had managed to put core banking systems into the cloud, which is quite rare for banks. Most banks I've met would say, that's illegal, you can't do that. Well, they did. And I was curious, how did you pull that trick off? You put core banking systems that used to be written in COBOL, you somehow put it in the cloud, and you solved it both technically and legally, and then sped up your, your, your iteration cycle. And they said, well, the key thing that al allowed us to do that was we took a lawyer and put him on the team. <laughs> Literally on, on, the, on the Scrum team. And it turned out that most of the impediments to putting core banking systems in the cloud were just imagined impediments. So like Mina was talking about, combining these different industries, combining different perspectives, you put the more the more wide uh, range of roles you have in this team, the more innovative they'll they, they will they will tend to be. So yeah, teams is one symptom of real agility, right? Another symptom is customer focus. You notice that these teams don't just sit around waiting for someone to tell them what to do; they are proactive. They're going to go out and find out who uses this toast, <laughs> and and what and what what do they think about the toast? Why do they want toast anyway? Is there anything else I can give them instead? Right? They'll want to talk to users. They'll want to have dashboards and metrics to find out. So very, very customer driven. Another thing you notice is they obsess over the feedback loop. They want to automate the shit out of everything. <laughs> right? Automate testing, automate release. You can't automate all testing, but you can automate a lot of it. And then you can, you know, do manual testing for the parts that really need creative thinking. Right? So they, they automate a lot to speed up the feedback loop and they insist in having a close collaboration between us and whoever is actually using the thing we're building. And the final symptom is, is uh, a very experimental mindset. The, the notion that there's not a single way to work. There's no one best way. So they're going to be trying things. Nothing is considered holy, right? We do Scrum for a while. Hmm, maybe we skip sprints and put in a bit of Kanban. Uh, that kind of worked. Oh, well, what about let, let's, 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 let's do continuous delivery using this tool. No, that didn't work. Let's try this one instead. Let's, let's, make, let's turn all this into one big team. And ah, oh, that got too messy. Let's make lots of small teams. Hmm, and they're always trying things out both in the way they work, but also in the product. What if we organize the product this way? What if we put the menu on that side, right? And then doing A-B testing and measuring things like that. So yeah, those are some uh, overall random thoughts about where the heck we're headed with Agile and hopefully some useful uh, tips and recommendations. So, thank you. Tack så mycket, Henrik. Vi borde Tackar. ha mer rekvisita på event. Det är Räckte inte det här? Ja, men det är perfekt, men ja. det borde vara fler. Mer, mer grejer. Jag, 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 jag har plats, jag kan ta med en tredje toast. En till toast. Ja. Har vi någon <laughs> snabb fråga till Henrik? Här har vi en fråga. Ja. I'll repeat the question. Is there some certain time that you should allow, you know, the, the agile process to when when a team is starting their agile way of working? Well after after how long will you see some results? Yeah, when when are we done? Yeah. Well I thought I heard <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, that you are so getting somewhere. I would somewhere. say the snarky response to that, I apologize for the snarky response, is never because you're never there. It's agile is really a, a direction and, and not 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 a place. So th that's, that's a short answer, you, you're never finished. But in terms of when would we expect to see results, I hate to pull out the, in the it depends cards, but I mean, I've seen companies that are going on for years and they get nowhere because the culture is fundamentally not open to this way of working. And then they'll keep working the way they do until a, a, a disruptor comes along and then they die and make space for new companies. So that's one end of the spectrum. Other end of the spectrum is companies that are born with an agile mindset from the beginning, they, 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 they get it. They might get stuck because of old habit, 
Maybe they learned some from school that waterfall is a normal way of working, and they're confused by that. One little nudge, just you know, maybe even a talk like this, and then suddenly, bam, they're being super agile. So the spectrum is is huge. But in general, I would say a company that that accepts this, with that that is really motivated to do this, right, and is willing to invest. Um, in actually making the, the change, I would be surprised if you can't see some kind of results within a few months, probably. And, and the results I'm talking about is, is basically faster feedback and then also, mo also motivation is usually one of the visible things. Um. Henrik, yeah. du hänger kvar på lunchen ett tag så vi ja, kan ja, fråga mer. Ja, jag är kvar på lunchen, yes. Ah, vad trevligt! Okay. Tack så hemskt mycket för Thank att du kom hit.